So what is the is the potential is this the box vector of the three and then getting getting you a little bit of the function molecules with uh many molecules as flavor. Okay. Uh you know why do we study dipolar molecules? Yeah, I know one simple reason is that you have this dipole moment that can be used. Controlled very easily with the vector field. It's got a long range, strong dipolar interactions that can bring in some new functional knobs for many body physics. One example is I know, really for the long standing uh, sort of inspiration in the field has been well, let's create degenerate fermi gas or degenerate quantum gas of molecules in different spatial geometries, such as the 2D charts like this. An independent Fermi C, if you can cool the temperature down, you have these three independent Fermi Cs. If the thermal energy is really low, you can start to see pairing between the neighbor, not only within the pancake, but actually between the neighboring pancakes. So you can have, you know, in some sense, it's older than Fermi C, and yet older can emerge by the, by the pairing of these dipolar molecules. And when you pair them up, up from two fermions form the boson, and three fermions remain to be a fermion, they get this very exotic quantum energy. People in this loop have uh, have studied this, and we can use, for example, like the field to select individual pancakes out to, to study what's going on in the, the, the dynamics of these molecular systems. People like uh, Noam Yaw and so on have used the dipolar uh, systems like such as that to study topological oscillators and uh, maybe even you know, superconductors uh, that mimicking high temperatures. Say what I know I'm looking for a wearable microphone, but I guess <laughs> you see it. Yeah. Okay. Is this, this keep, keep, going. keep going. Okay. So you know when I talked about it here in this slide is about the bone gas and how you study. You know, we have already heard about super solids and the physics that can emerge. Thank you for this Yeah. <laughs> But you can also put these molecules inside the optical lattices uh, and study you know, like polar spin lattices. There's a really interesting physics where you have the motions frozen and you can really study in you know, one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions of a dipolar crystal. You can encode dipolar moment uh, with rotational freedom of molecules very easily. There are, of course, other exotic molecules that's being studied here in Harvard. And uh, but here I'm just taking the rotational freedom of certain rotational states. You can easily encode a spin half systems. You can pick different parts of the rotational states such that you can actually tune the dipole interaction even in the middle of the state of which I will show you by switching, swapping the, the, the dipole states and then actually reverse the interaction for the in the middle of the before you have to you tune on the uh, and uh, use microwave to uh, to turn you to the Position of this is yeah. Let me see. Just making sure that I'm giving you the that, that that's not the right talk. <laughs> uh, that's I'm, I apologize for that. I know I have a talk prepared because I was. Yeah, that's the right one. Sorry, so uh, in the Zoom, I have to go see I'd have to go out of the sharing Hopefully this, yeah, this this should be good. I was going through this. 
And I you know, so talking about that holistic and that's why we want to study that holistic and that's, uh, and then yes, this actually gives a little bit of more sort of, sort of a seminar flavor of the uh, uh, introducing bipolar interactions in, in the investing in artists. But the Harvard uh, Marcus School is studying the Amoeba and they can actually use that as an example to compare. For example, in our case, we use KIV molecules so that electrical dipole moment of the magnetic dipole moment is a little bit stronger. So if you suppose make the same uh, spin lattice with the same period with the KIV molecules with the electrical dipole moment, uh, the interaction stress compared to the Earth. Again, so for example, would be 77 times bigger. It's a long range of the dipole interaction type of wall bar cube. Uh, the electrical field to the dipole moment, uh, uh, the dipole interactions are in astrophic, but what's nice about the electrical field is it's very easily manipulable, both the magnitude and orientation. Uh, so you can tune this dipole interactions. I will show you some, <laughs> quite a few examples of tuning the components with that. And of course, you can have the dipole moment roaming free in a, in a particular spatial geometry, or you can have a little lattice turned on so that I want to pop in around this tunnel, but you can have on-site interactions, you can have super exchange interactions. And then start to have the ingredients of building this so-called dipolar spin lattice component. And here's a clear role, here's kind of a Fermi Hubbard uh, model where you show dipole dipole interaction with both spin exchange part on, on the front. Uh, uh, and a spin uh, in this particular form, the spin exchange and the uh, uh, Ising interactions, the difference is, is shown as a symbol of chi, and you have an SC squared term, S represents a particular uh, spin uh, 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 component of a, of a dipolar molecule. So you can see, start to see the spin component being formed here with the dipolar interactions. You have a tunneling of these molecules moving around the top of the lattices. And in the on-site interaction. So this is 2D. This can be this can be in 2D, 1D, 3D, however you want to configure your lines. So I and J in this particular case just indices of the of the of the <coughs> uh, and the dipolar molecules feature is a long quantum coherence. You have these tunable long range interactions. Therefore, you can look at how to tune the dipolar interactions, how to tune the the, 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 the as a bird is asking which thing Nationality, or you can actually configure these quite easily with optical analysis, optical tweezer as well. Uh, and you can control the tunneling with the, the depth of these lattices, and of course, on site interactions given by the molecular property, but also part of the, uh, it's also tunable with the electrical field of bipolar interaction. So, the study of bipolar lattice, one of the key in inspirational motivations to connect to. Uh, Exotic quantum matters such as high temperature superconductivity or quantum magnetism, where you can have spin fluctuations and so on in systems like this. So, let me just give you a little bit of a more introductory material on, on tunable bipolar interactions in the, in the lattice. Again, this term is the so called uh, Heisenberg interaction, JZ term, SD squared. This is the spin exchange term, SXSY, uh, or while raising and lowering operators, so SX squared, SY squared, and plus uh, this uh, the uh, phase term where each, each spin is subject to, in principle, electric field noise and so on, and other phase noise. As I mentioned earlier, the spin half is encoded in rotational degrees of freedom. You can have ground state, rotational ground state is spin down, rotational excited is spin up, and when you apply electric field, uh, the rotation of uh, the molecules gets polarized under this framework, and you have this dipole interactions. And this electrical field tunability of the dipole is, is a very easily manu manu uh, controllable. Uh, you can turn the electrical field, of, for example, in our lab from DC to from zero all the way up to 15 kilovolts per centimeter, and you can actually tune uh, the, the Ising interactions where both springs are down, down, or up, up, or even up and down. They can have, they can have this Ising interaction done. And all three of them is tunable to the spectrum of that field. You may be wondering, what do you mean by up and down, down, down? Why are, are you tuning the electrical field? Or are you tuning the electrical field? Why these numbers are being changed? Just remember, if you before you tune on the electrical field, there is no Ising interaction. The molecules do not have dipole moment in the lab frame without electrical field. And it's only when you turn up the electrical field, you're quantizing the molecules in that particular direction. The, the 
original state of the molecules, which belong to the eigen state of the hematonia, the molecular hematonia, not get state, gets gets hybridized, gets mixed up, down up, and up and down becomes so called addressed state by the electric field. So this down carries some characters of up, and vice versa, the up carries some characters of down. And these up and down is no longer the, the original argon state of the molecule, rather they become state mixed here to the here to the dipole moment. And because of that, you can have a down down has a mostly the character depending on the electric field magnitude. There's a the, the dipole start to show up even in the pure state of down because that, that pure state down and the electric field is not a really pure state under the original molecule. And so up up can also have a dipole moment, and therefore you can have this uh, has a break interactions. But you still have the spin exchange interaction between up and down. This up and down again is the mixed frame. When I have electric field, but you can see this exchange term actually comes down compared to when there's zero electric field, the spin exchange work interaction is actually the strongest. But as you turn up the electric field, the spin exchange is coming down like five meters going up. Okay, and then there's a statistic phasing single particle phasing term. Now, if you come back to Say I want to do this hematonia with electric field. You write down the spin half hematonia without altering the electric moment. Uh, if I rewrite this term as the difference between the spin exchange and Ising, this is how you do introduce the parameter pi equals to spin uh, Ising interaction minus spin exchange interaction, then I can rewrite this hematonia as just the term of the total spin the s bar s term plus the chi. And this chi s z squared term is a very primitive so called single axis twisting in the same form. And you can look at this form and you can see, okay, I can control this component quite easily, both by controlling the total energy of spin-spin interactions, as well as controlling the difference between Ising and the spin exchange interaction. So for example, some special cases, if you turn the Ising interaction to be zero, uh, or the spin exchange interaction to be zero, you would just have the Ising term, JZ squared term, and the so-called Ising model. You can go to the Heisenberg XXX model if chi equals to zero, where a Heisenberg interaction, the spin exchange interaction equals to each other. This term drops out, and you can see sort of a, 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 a boring spin evolution because the S bar squared is actually conserved quantity under this um, under this mechanism. And you will see like the you know, Durandi spectroscopy, the spin, uh, the coherence just stays on forever. And you, or you can go to the XY model where you don't have electrical field. Uh, so that you do not have the Ising interaction, you only have the J spin exchange interaction. You have to study the XY model, where you have only have SX squared plus SY squared with not SD squared. So all these things can be tuned very easily with that. But it's actually also interesting, in, especially if here in, in Harvard, uh, Michelle Lupin School has pioneering, pioneered a lot of these so called local engineering. And you can actually use molecules as a perfect example to benchmark. Uh, the block engineering. That's because since I can tune with electric field of this relative magnitude of the spin exchanges and Ising, well, the block engineering is about so you have this block sphere, but you can certainly use do a number of pulse sequences such that when you're still you're interacting with SZ, SZ square term, but if you turn your head 90 degrees, that SZ square term becomes X, 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 X square plus Y square term. So by Waiting on different sort of uh, by rotating the pulses into different axes and waiting a certain amount of time, you can actually realize these kind of spin Hamiltonians even without any electric field. And this is the color flow of engineering. But you can actually use either this pulse sequence or use electrical field to tune this Hamiltonian and then benchmark each other. Do they give you the same dynamics? You said you have realized whatever the exotic spin Hamiltonians. Can we do that with both? Engineering of the pulse sequences, or use electrical field to tune it, and to see the same spin dynamics coming out of the system. And that the molecule is actually a, is a perfectly good example because you, you can tune these various different ways of studying the semitonic dynamics. So, so now putting all these ingredients together, and I'm showing you this uh, Fermi Hubbard model with the spin uh, dipolar interactions again. You can have the XXZ spin Hamiltonian in the front. You can you can have the on-site interactions, and it becomes a super complex uh, problems that uh, the so-called TG 
the EW model where you have itinerants be moving around, interacting with each other. They have long range interactions that give rise to a really complex space diagram in the, in the quantum states. So we, let me start historically. How we started this experiment is by doing first doing the supported XY model where we do not have the field, AC electric field, and then all we have, remember, was just a spin exchange return. Then we actually tuned on the vector field. Now this allows you to tune the chi. So, so this is a more complete spin half Neptonian. We can realize X and Z spin with Neptonian. You can then let the molecules surrounding free uh, in 2D plane and study how the dipole moment colliding with each other, how the, the phase can be preserved or, or be completely scrambled due to the collision and due to the long range dipole interactions. What kind of a mechanism is this collective speed interactions now, or is this faster defacing? These are the problems actually Marcus's group is, is exploring right now with the early atoms. So you can see a lot of an analogy between these systems. And or, or you can and it actually tune the tunneling strength so that you can see the competition of on-site interactions, maybe in the future speed exchange interactions where the filling is, is very tall versus the uh, dipole interactions and so on. So, so I want to get go, go through the evolution of the system, you know, starting to get into a very sophisticated spin model that's been realized with the platform models. But before I take uh, going, letting you go through this journey, I want to actually connect back to the early days of again Alex Delgado. And when Alex was writing papers about cold chemistry here, that really inspired the work worldwide in Boulder, Colorado. We and I mentioned this uh, in, in on Tuesday's lecture that we did 2003 to 2008 with the collaboration of Hong Quinn and uh, Debbie and myself and so on, Paul Julian and uh, Svetlana Kosachkova were finally able to produce bio fly molecules by through this, uh, in this case, a fermented CL of potassium with a boson of the CL of rubidium going through the so-called fresh buffer resonance and going through the stira coherent Raman transfer process, producing molecules in the absolute low average of ground state and electronic ground state, and, and, in, and in doing so with a such care, uh, coherent fashion that no energy that's being uh, introduced in the system, except the stira efficiency is not 100%, except the, also the fresh buffer process is not 100%. So there are some holes you make in this BC, otherwise it's degenerative. Uh, quantum gas, but in uh, 15 years ago, so uh, the, the gas is still thermal, the temperature is still above the so-called Fermi temperature. Yeah, it took us 10 years finally get into the uh, into the quantum degeneracy with the 30,000 TRP molecules, where TLTF is now 0.3. And this has since been uh, 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 expanded into other molecular species, such, such as sodium potassium in both in here in Germany and, and in USTC in China. Re very recently, actually, a very exciting new development, Sebastian Well at Columbia was able to produce a both ions and condensate of the bioplatin. All, all the previous experiments are degenerate from these gas. And, and the one example in the early days when we were, you know, to try to prove that this, this gas is actually degenerate from the gas, we, we actually looked at, for example, the particle natural fluctuations different regions of the density distribution. In the middle of the Fermi C, the density distribution tends to be more uh, less fluctuation because of the equivalent principle. First on the edges, uh, where the, it becomes more like a thermal gas. So the, the number of fluctuation looks uh, Poissonian and, 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 and the Gaussian distribution uh, normalized by the particle number approaches one, the so-called uh, the classical the shot noise limit. And so you can actually take an image of such a uh, Fermi gas and then fit away with the uh, Fermi direct distribution and look at the residual uh, spin noise. And you can indeed see with the potassium atomic Fermi gas, you can see a very, very strong suppression of the density density fluctuation in the middle of the crowd. And the KRB also see very pronounced density density fluctuation that's being suppressed due to the Fermi C statistics. So uh, Alice made a prediction a long time ago. Uh, in fact, this is the, one of the early papers that launched the field of the cold molecules. Uh, basically, at the, at the time, it was Bala who predicted that the behavior of chemical reactivity 
in the vision of the zero temperature would be dictated by quantum mechanics, by the by uh, how the quantum waves come together and, and the quantum statistics and the long range wave functions and so on will dictate the random uh, range uh, force would dictate the chemical reaction. And and this process indeed was true when the KRB molecule was first brought to the quantum uh, regime. Uh, you can see that because the temperature is so low and these are fermionic molecules, you have this uh, lowest uh, partial wave is the one h by and the one h by is the angular momentum. That's the so-called a P wave. And if associated with the P wave, you have the uh, centrifugal barrier. The molecules will have to tunnel because the temperature is on the, of the few hundred nanocalvin while the P wave height is a 24 microcalvin. So you have to tunnel uh, behind the barrier to have a chemical reaction take place. And this is very much uh, reminiscent of early days of people studying nuclear reactions with the neutron has to tunnel through the, the barrier. And the Eugene Wigner set up all these threshold of laws. And, and here, the quantum statistics and the threshold of laws, single partial wave collisions dictate chemical reactions. Essentially, it's all along with physics. It's interesting here. When you turn up the electrical field at the time uh, when the molecules are still in three dimensional space, it, uh, it breaks the, the isotropic landscape of the P wave barrier uh, because the molecules have to be aligned with the electrical field and they can collide head on and they can attract each other at the low end of the barrier or side by side, enhancing the barrier. Therefore, the molecules can more easily go, uh, go through this barrier at chemical reactions that these two huge laws went to. When you try to study high-polar physics, the molecules are all going undergoing chemical reactions. And this actually led to uh, some decade-long sort of effort in the community to how to shield these molecules, suppress molecular loss. And in particular, I want to highlight work both here at Harvard uh, that pioneered with a tweezer such with the molecules and such tweezer. Of course, you only have one molecule per tweezer that are lost there, and you can still bring tweezers together and have molecule interactions. Earlier in Java, we, we put the molecules in optical lattices, and this similar idea that all the molecules are only one occupying one site. And then actually, there's a very interesting phenomenon called the quantum zeno effect that if the molecule pops to the other molecule, you know, remember in, in the when the interaction is completely conservative, if you have the, the lot of insulating physics, the, the U will block you from occupying the unsighted interaction, will block you from having two molecules occupying the same site. Turns out, if the interaction is actually completely lossy, it's the same blocking mechanism will work. That as if the molecule knows, if I go onto the next labeling site, there's another molecule which for me and ready to go through a re chemical reaction, that alone will stabilize molecules on individual sites. It's, it's the same physics of the T squared of the U, except the U can be imaginary number that can stabilize molecules that way. So, so there's a body of work to start to making sure these molecules at least are staying put, and they can turn on the dipole moment. Later on, uh, that we will. In, in order to, for example, improve the filling fraction, we did try to really go down to study the bulk gas of a of the generator C. And uh, we started to uh, release the molecules into, uh, in this particular case, say 2D geometry. And these molecules start to collide with each other. And we find out, of course, you can use electric field still perpendicular, uh, polarized molecules perpendicular to the, to the plane. And you can have side by side collisions, which is also. To, that, to dominate over the reactive, the reactive loss. And at that time, also in the same year, because the temperature was going down, we, we, we start to tune around the uh, electrical field. They actually we discovered that there's a, a resonance that can be brought up. It was, a, it was just a static electrical field tuning. And I will explain to you the, the mechanism of that static electrical field tuning tuned uh, resonance shielding. And that was actually quite useful because you can use this technique no longer limit yourself to a 2D geometry. You can actually apply this resonance shielding 3D gas, and it works. So you can actually use this technique to do the evaporative cooling. And now a much, much more uh, sort of a powerful technique. That's because you can actually shield, send a microwave light. You do not have to go in, in our experiment. We have to go inside the vacuum chamber to put on electrodes to turn on the electrical field. But this technique, I think this uh, the antenna was Really, the joint effort of Kung Quinn and uh, John Doyle, uh, Lloyd here has done a quite a 
quite a few of pioneering studies with microwave shielding to very, very similar ideas, except that here you see a CPO to, to connect two particular opposite parity states, and you can tune the relative uh, frequency between the microwave and, and, and the, the molecular resonance to create a sort of blue detuned uh, the sh uh, shielding so that molecules never get a chance to come to very short range to have chemical reactions. And this is a more straightforward to implement because you can have a microwave form from outside the vacuum chamber just shining. And that's really working like Gangbuster and all the recent work of the DEC of a Sebastian Well is using this technique of a microwave shielding. So this is actually very important because molecules tend to have chemical reactions. And if you put a hat on as a physicist, do you want to actually suppress it uh, so you can enjoy these as spin many physics? And so this is a prelude of, for us to be able to study the spin dynamics and in, in the quantum shadow region. So the, the, let me give you a little bit more detail of the gel approach of the, doing this shielding. We, we have these six electrodes um, that allowed us to tune the electrical field in an arbitrary configuration. You can have them perpendicular when you have two plates, or you can tune them around by charging up these rods as well. You can actually make the electrical field perpendicular to the plane or parallel to the plane. We can also control the electrical field strength. We can even control the gradient. So that was a very important step in our second generation we had experiment. We put those electrodes inside a vacuum chamber. It looks so just like this. The, the vacuum cell is a degenerative gas of molecule lives in the middle of this region where it's surrounded by six electrodes that can allow you to tune the electrode. Um, and we put a you know, bunch of optical beams in there. It, it, these are basically different configurations of optical dipole traps, glass dipole traps, called evaporation, uh, optical lattices with uh, confining the molecules. We can do a quite high resolution imaging, but these images are, are deceiving. It's not a Marcus uh, single side resolution. This is actually pancake by pancake, but we actually do this, um, you know, you put the molecules inside in the ground state, you wait for a quarter period, the molecule turn into from the ground state into the momentum states, and you let them go. And when they free fly, you can take an image and these are actually individual lattice things, uh, lattice sites that being imaged. But it was not in situ image but after they had a chance to give the momentum space to fly out for a little bit. <laughs> and later on, we, however, we can use the electrical field to turn on the electrical field gradient and go in to select individual sites. So this imaging is actually individual site image. Uh, and it can uh, still in situ imaging, but it, the resolution is not, not not good. But you can nevertheless see individuals, uh, individual slice of the two D layers of the uh, of the molecular physics. So uh, when I mentioned earlier that you can use it, just DC electrical field perpendicular to the plane, you can do the shielding. And indeed, this is actually a theoretical prediction by John Bong and the Kuban Kamenera. They had a predicted in 2010, if you turn up the field, it shield away uh, with an electrical field perpendicular to these 2D geometry. You can turn on the electrical dipole moment interact the elastic component of it, while the inelastic part can be suppressed in the sense of dipole interactions are long range and the, the, the force can be strong. But the short, since they never get too close to each other, they're shielding them with each other, the, the, the reactive loss is, is being uh, is suppressed. So Sorry, you know, I just got an email from Jacqueline that she cannot see the, the slides clearly. She sees the room. Oh. I wonder if the she could check to see whether it's actually shared properly. <clears throat> but it's just that this is connected. It's working. Okay. Um, so you have to go inside the room and to see if, if it's share. No, all of it's, those are connected. That's, that's still good. But sharing, I think, is because if it's not shared properly, Mm -hmm. It can then uh, show the room, but not the. I think that's that, so that should do it. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. Can you ask uh, Jacqueline to check sure, if I this is working? I think I think right now it should be should should be okay. Yeah. You think it's okay? Yeah, because it says sharing and then it sees. Yeah, think. okay. That's it. Well, apologize, Jacqueline. <laughs> Thank you.
And so, so this is talking about the guy using this DC like to be of the sheet to suppress the elastic loss and while maintaining the elastic collision of lock keys. So we can actually get to the point where elastic collision rate is a you know, two orders of magnitude above inelastic loss rate, such that you can actually use this technique to do the elastic cooling in 2D. And here shows getting to the Fermi degeneracy TR TF going below one, approaching 0 0.5. And we plotted it, you know, this is 2D uh, excess Fermi energy as a function of the TLTF. And then this curve, for 2D, you get easier into the quantum degeneracy just by the end of the field with the XF states being compared to 3D. Then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a, also a technique by tuning electric field to a particular location, particular value. You can actually tune on sort of a collisional resonance. It's not a flash buffer. Resonance. It's more like a foster resonance in the Greenberg physics to use this technique to do also do uh, specific shielding. And this technique works. You do not have to use molecular orientation. This is intrinsically uh, a 3D technique, that 3 dimensional technique. The idea being the following if I prepare the molecules, a pair of molecules in the rotational excited state one, for example, and, and when the two molecules being dragged by the electric field, this, the, and the energy is like the, this, this so called uh, weak field seeking state, the energy actually goes up. And actually, at certain electric fields, such as 11.8 uh, kilovolts per centimeter, the, the in energy of the two molecules in 1010 zero, one, zero rotational state will be degenerate with more molecules zero, the other molecules rotational state of two. Uh, and in, in, in this particular point, when they have energy degeneracy, the molecules also have dipolar interactions. So dipolar interactions get to open up this, this crossing to be this avoid crossing. And depending on where you are, if you're above that electric field resonance, if you're here, for example, your 1010 zero, zero molecules be prepared above the electric field of this zero part of this uh, energy, energy generosity point, dipole dipole interaction lifts up the barrier. Preventing these two molecules to come further close because of the, the dipolar dipolar interaction. On the other hand, if you are located below that, that resonance, the interaction actually lower the barrier so to actually suck the molecules in to have chemical reactions. And you can see this very, very nicely, you know, this kind of a resonant behavior where the two body loss coefficient can be modulated by the nearly three orders of magnitude by tuning the electric field and on the order of one percent also you see this. Remarkable resonance where you can have very strong chemical reactions or, or suppressed chemical reactions just, just around this point. And how sharp these resonance is, is all dependent on how, how steep the slope is, because the dipolar interaction is fixed, but how steep this is the molecular property, if it is if the energy change as a function of the electric field, the rather steep this, this resonance gets steeper and steeper, it gets a shallower, uh, narrower. So this is what was quite nice to see, and it was actually initially predicted again by John Bong and Fu Wang from the air. So, so now imagine you sit, you park yourself at this particular location where the, the two-body loss coefficient is suppressed due to this dipolar uh, shielding mechanism, and you still have elastic dipole left. Uh, it's not a super strong, but it's still a dipolar gas, and you can actually use this technique. As I mentioned earlier, you do not have to combine them in this two-dimensional lattices. So you actually have them in an optical dipole trap and start to do three-dimensional dipolar phase uh, evaporative cooling. And you can see the phase space density is intensing. If you plot a number of molecules as a function of the temperature, the slope is much gentler than if it's constant phase space density plot. So that was also very intelligent and start to uh, do evaporation. Now that with microwave shielding, of course. People are, are doing all these sort of uh, three dimensional evaluation now, all the way to DC or the generator of gas. And then one more trick that we did uh, uh, in, in that in preparing the spin -like lattice work is uh, the capability of going in and select individual uh, layers of the 2D packet, uh, 2D traps. In this particular case, if I apply electric field gradient, uh, we can see the rotational map, the, this is rotational spectroscopy, rotational resonance between zero and the ground state and the first excited rotational state. And there's DC start shift. Uh, if the electrical field experienced by each individual layer is different, then the resonance frequency of the rotational spectroscopy is different for each individual 10 layers. 
And as an example, by tuning the microwave frequencies, you can pick in, in, in any candy of pancake you want it. And in fact, when you pick a native pancake, you can also drive this particular pancake of molecules to different locations of contributions. So you can make all kinds of different flavors of sandwich of molecules with different rotational states and so on. Prepared. So those are the other that important ingredients of the controlling techniques. Now we are ready to study specific cells uh, used as inspiration. Again. So let's start with 10 years ago of dipolar XY model. In that, in that particular case, we do not have electric field, DC electric field. At the time, we only had the tool of just microwave. But you can turn on the microwave, put the molecules in the coherence position between zero and one, call it spin down and spin up. And you can have the spin exchange interaction between the neighboring molecules on the order of 100 hertz interaction. The typical distance between these uh, is about on the order of 500 meters or so. And so you, you realize with this particular Hamiltonian, XY Hamiltonian, there's no SZ square term. There's just SX square plus SY square, what you call S plus S minus. And so that with lower than uh, raising and lower operators of the polymation system. So it's, it, we use Ramsey spectroscopy to study the spin dynamics. The Ramsey contrast, in some ways, it allows you to study the sort of the magnetization of the, of the spin system. Uh, you prepare, for example, the molecules in coherence for position up and down, and you let them evolve. Uh, here, this is just a very simple spin echo sequence. Later on, we would have many, many complex uh, sort of dynamic decoupling forces in the middle. But spin echo is a very basic uh, embodiment of this, of the little bit of a manipulation during the spin evolution. And you just read the uh, Ramsey branch contrast out once you have it resolved into the, the final stages rotating around the the, the block sphere of the equatorial plane by, the, by, by adjusting the phase, you can read out the contrast. And this contrast actually carries information about the, the, the spin dynamics of this uh, of, of these spins in there. And you can see that this the contrast of the range range as a function of time, and there's some oscillatory behavior. This oscillatory behavior, in fact, is an indicator of the so-called spin exchange interaction, this, this J. Uh, a particular term that was describing the X Y point. The reason why we figured it out that's actually due to spin exchange in the early days was actually thanks to the collaboration with Misha's group. Uh, Misha told us about the Wahoo protocols at, at the time in 2013, and it's actually very, very, very uh, interesting because it's very, very brief. Uh, I just always think you know if you write down a little bit of mathematics, and you can see that how the entangling gates and so on works. And it's very, very interesting to teach students when you, when you say, well, you have two molecules in the spin exchange with certain time, the two molecules get entangled. And you can just entangle them very easily. And the technique is the following. If you put two molecules in square position like that, up and down, uh, if you write down what the wave function is, is up and down plus up and down. And so you have up, up, down, down. And basically, you, you form the spin triplets. Now, if you look at the difference between down, down, up, up, Whereas up and down plus down up. This down up plus up down is the so called spin exchange, which enjoy this J uh, perpendicular term, the spin exchange interaction. Therefore, if you let them evolve for a certain time, this, this term create uh, gain some phase shift because of this energy difference. This is spin exchange interaction energy is there. While down down and up up does not enjoy the spin exchange interaction, therefore it's stationary. And this is where this oscillatory behavior is coming to our range. But you can remove this if you say, well, I'm not going to do another pulse. I rotate it up, you know, you're, you're rot initially rotate up like here, and you just do local rotation like this. You can go from, do that local rotation by along the opposite, instead of a Y axis, but X axis on block sphere. You can, you can swap the up and down plus down up into down and down plus up. By doing this, now you can see now this gear can essentially move, move the face, the this extra phase shift onto the down, down, up, up by just doing that. And this up and down plus down up is ready to pick up phase shift again if you give them some free evolution time. And depending on how much time you want to give to that, it, it picks up, for example, T over A to T the total evolution time. And so you give them one eighth of that phase shift instead of one sixteenth of the phase shift. And then you do this operation yet one more time to, to put it in T over A's and just swap the phase shifts back and forth. 
These are just a very simple operation on the block sphere, rotating 90 degrees versus x axis, y axis on the block sphere. And you let them evolve one more time with after the uh, global spin echo to remove single particle phase noise. And you can see by doing this, you can have a common phase factor T over A, T over A coming out, both in terms of uh, down, down, up, up, forward, up, down, down, up. And this is a common phase. You can factor it out. If you do that, there's no more oscillation. So the, the, the two particles can be entangled or can be disentangled just by manipulating those phases. It was, I, I thought in the early days, we were not talking about quantum deformation at that time. But you know, Misha taught, uh, uh, taught us how to do these kind of a full sequence and, and a very, very nice way of looking at entanglement and, and uh, disentangling mm -hmm. molecules. So the most recently, of course, we can now have this back to field control. We can go from XY model to XXZ model. Um, by simply turning on the vector field, these molecules are oriented with respect to the lab point. Before, remember when I used the microwave, these molecules have no orientation with respect to the, to the lab frame, except that they will move around with the point the microwave is saying, I'm preparing for your position, so in the in that rotating frame of two gigahertz, the molecules have orientation. But now I can actually have a DC orientation, but you can actually see that field. In the Hamiltonian case, uh, that we know that now you have the IC term uh, in, in addition to the spin exchange term. And you can again look at the Ramsey decay. Uh, those are decay curves we use for different chi. Remember the chi parameter I introduced earlier? That's the difference between spin exchange and stream uh, uh, IC torch. Since I have both of them, I can tune this chi from nearly zero or something on the order of 100 hertz or so. And you, see, you, can, you can see when the chi is really large. The contrast is much, much faster. And to, to make sure that this is the many body physics, not just the defacing effect of the electric field, we, we studied them as a function of the molecular number density, the filling fraction. And you can see that the K, of course, is proportional to the, the filling fraction, the lattice. And so, therefore, you can actually normalize against the density, against the filling, pull out this K, uh, this K parameter, cover parameter, should I call it. That's a decay parameter, but it's densely normalized. And you can plot this as a function of chi, for example. So remember, just to remind you, this is the plot we had how fast the contrast decay as a function of density, and we pull out the slope. That's the number of kappa. If you plot kappa as a function of the electric field, as we tune the electric field from zero all the way out to 13 kilovolts per centimeter. You are going through chi from minus 200. Why it's, why it's minus 200 to 300 is because this, that when electric field equals to zero, there's only spin exchange interaction, there's no icing. And then you can go through this so called Heisenberg point when the spin exchange and the icing uh, and the spin exchange interaction and the icing interaction equals to each other. And that's the Heisenberg point. Well, then they go above to the icing bound in the region. And you have to look at the decay of this constant. Uh, the, uh, the, the Ramsey fringe contrast, you can go through this very interesting regime where the Heisenberg point basically the Ramsey contrast never decays because it's just spin interaction uh, gap that's uh, preserving this spin coherence. There's no chi trying to twist this out of your, 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 your equatorial plane. But on either side, when it looks like the, the, the contrast decay goes much faster when we have spin exchange interaction or ice interaction, almost like a symmetrical way. Uh, and, and it just means that the sign of the chi matters when, the, when these molecules are pinned down, they're not moving around. And the physics will change when, they, when you let molecules to actually start to roll around. Uh, you start to study the itinerant situation. But in this case, you can see uh, very strong simulations by the so called base, which is nothing but overlapping clusters of, you know, since you cannot simulate until clear that it will develop a real one. Now is to calculate one out of molecules that is in the system. You can't really by simulate one out of molecules that whole interaction, but you can simulate with 10 molecules and overlap them. And these are the simulations for the maze. And you can see the theory simulation actually overlaps to the experimental data quite well to describe in this in this particular case of a spin model where the molecules are not moving, but only spin interactions through that whole interaction. You can just be described very well by the same, the absolute magnitude, magnitude of chi, the difference between spin exchange and, and, the, and the icing. But now, and I want to stop here for a moment to say 
Well, you can assume that Hamiltonian was a magical field, as I mentioned earlier, but you can also do global engineering. And that, uh, this is actually quite a cute experiment, very recent, to do benchmark uh, global engineering with electrical field tuning. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the same Hamiltonian can be realized not by tuning the electrical field, but just by tuning the angle of the block sphere. You start with SC, SC square term, you move yourself by pi over two pulse onto the equatorial plane, you turn it into X square term. Uh, and so on. So, so you can you can see this kind of a triangulation where you can have whether you have started with a gx, gz, gy, this represents xx, y, y, z, z, but you can actually put yourself into y, y plus z, z by, by going to this frame or going to the xx plus z, z in this frame. Just and they are all related by pi over two along various different axes on the block sphere. How much interaction energy you want to introduce depends on how much time you let them spend in these different frames. So that's actually quite nice, very flexible, as long as you get very high fidelity pulse points. So we checked on one thing, for example, how good is our spin rotation on these molecules with the microwave. And, and it turns out, you know, we can, after we can, we, we basically apply thousands, thousands of these pulses and see how much mistake we make on these spin rotations. And we actually benchmark, for example, on, on this randomized benchmarking of the pulse fidelity, we can actually get to three nines or so. So indicating if we want to do very complicated pulse sequence for this thing, the Hamiltonian for engineering, we can actually do that. So this is a picture showing uh, GXY. Remember, remember, these are a generic terms of interactions of an Ising versus spin exchange. And I'm showing you GZ as a, as, a, as a relationship with GXY. This is basically showing SZ square term versus SX square, SY square terms. And I can start with, for example, when the electrical field, both with electrical field or with the flow engineering. If I start with electrical field equal to zero, you have only spin exchange interaction, there's no SGZ term. And as, as I tune up the electrical field, this following this red line, and you can see the the spin Hamiltonian being engineered by the electric field. But at the same time, you can do the same thing with just pulse sequences. And that's the blue line. And they look very, very similar uh, in terms of what kind of Hamiltonian you can achieve right, through these different techniques. And what's really remarkable is if you do experiments looking at the spin dynamics of the spin Hamiltonian, you can see the blue points done by low K engineering without DC electric field with just pulse sequences. While the red points for the data I showed you earlier with electrical field tuning of the spin and they lie really on top of each other along the same that's so that base image. And we learned a lot uh, of these pulse sequences and so on from, from these kind of recent papers uh, from the Hooking group. That the, the these molecules are still pinned down in 3D lattice. So when we became a little more brave, so we, so let's, let's say we just start to let molecules to move around. And, and study the so called as itinerant spin interactions, where you can still apply DC electric field as well as microwave to induce both AC dipole and DC dipole, the kind of complex molecular dipole systems. But at this time, they have extra communication where the molecules are not starting to collide with each other. It's totally complex. So this becomes definitely much more complicated, but you can actually separate into some different regimes. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Quasi 2D trap. What I really mean is along this tightly confining direction, the trap frequency is on the order of 20 kilohertz or so. In the weakly confining direction of this transverse plane, the frequency is on the order of just a few tens of hertz. So it's a quasi 2D system. And, and the interaction between these molecules are starting to be on the order of these separations of electrical field of freedom. If the interaction is relatively weak, you know, remember the interaction becomes like 100 hertz if the technology get close to 50 and uh, 500 n. But mostly, if you think about sort of in the mean field way, when the molecules can roam free, each molecule is confined and they're just moving along a particular energy scale on this uh, optical lattice. You know, this molecule, for example, these are the iron states of this transverse lattice. And the molecules were roughly that their energy is conserved. So it's just moving along on this particular trajectory, this molecule is moving on this particular trajectory. So in this momentum space, you can think of these molecules actually whipping through each other on average. And it's on average the dipole interaction, which is about the distance, the average distance of this traffic. And that interaction is actually weaker 
then the energy spacing of this slowly curves of how many charge rates. Another way of saying these these atoms, these molecules are interacting with each other now, not through the short wave wall of R2, because they on average they're moving around in the trap. And and so, so you can think of these, these interactions become more collective because each molecule, in some sense, is interacting with all of the other molecules since, since they are all moving around in, in this momentum space uh, with, a, with a constant momentum. And the interaction is weak enough such that if I'm in this particular momentum state, I'm not going to jump to another momentum state due to my interaction with other molecules. That model will break down when the interaction becomes stronger. But this model is a first order approximation, the Anna Maria Ray setup, which is a uh, uh, spin model in the momentum space. And that's actually is a quite um, powerful if you look at this. Uh, initially, I had a spin Hamiltonian which had the I and J emphasis, and the bird was asking, what does I and J, you know, what dimensionality? So this I and J used to indicate sites in, in the space. But now, as I was mentioning earlier, if you go to this collective spin kind of a picture where the, you think of the molecules occupying individual sites in the momentum space, or rather individual ion state of the transverse com uh, confinement, then this turns into a collective spin interaction. There's no, no more this is because the interaction is well equal as they have been being averaged by the by the, the trap size. So, so the the you you this. The individual molecules go away and, and replace it with the sum of the total spins. And now you have very simple Hamiltonians, just again, uh, spin exchange S square terms, and then the, the chi SD square term, the single axis twisting term. And so you can study this collective spin interactions. And, and the way to, for example, to figure out what are these parameters are, you can actually do Ramsey spectroscopy, for example. In this case, it's very simple. You can put your spin in, in coherence composition and wait for a certain time and read out and you can actually see the fringe shifts as a function of the jz minus j particular because this is a, nothing but the clock shift if you think about the rotational states is your atomic clock and then the sz square term meaning depending on the magnitude of the sz the shift can be either positive or negative below the crater above the crater and, and the depth, absolute magnitude of the shift the proportion of the SD, because the, the frequency shift is actually the H of the SD, that's the frequency shift, and you will see theoretically this frequency shift in the range fringe of the path. So by doing the range fringe, we can actually go in and uh, microscopically measure this chi fragment, and as we tune the electric field. And so as we tune the electric field magnitude, or we can also remember I mentioned that until the angle of the electric field with respect to the end wave. You can see the sky time just can go from positive value to negative value going through zero. Zero is that so far positive point. And you have all these control capabilities there. You can actually even, even more fun. Uh, the molecules uh, in the rotational excited state n equals to one. You can have n equals to one, zero, or one minus one, or plus one, right? There's the three different projections of, of the angular momentum with respect to n equals to one. And they turned out they have a different dipole moments. So you can prepare your system in coherence uh, position in between zero, zero, one, zero. And in the middle of the evolution, if you can revert, you can actually do, uh, swap the coherence position from one, zero to one minus one. And that interaction, because the dipole interaction is actually not on the opposite sign, you can reverse this uh, spin of the interaction. And this shows you know, the Ramsey bridge in the middle of the Ramsey bridge where, where you have, have a phase shift as a function of time. And this is the, given by this chi term. But then when I swap the, the rotational side state coherently in the middle of the Ramsey bridge, you can reverse the direction that goes opposite sign. The, the bridge actually moves this way and moves backwards. And these are the time reversal of the Hamiltonian engineering that. People like Monica Stroy Smith and uh, a lot of British and so on have already been thinking about it. So, so called quantum amplification, where instead of trying to read out spin sweeping by, by the single axis twisting term, you can actually reverse this, uh, the spin squeezing operation such that you do not have to read this very, very thin quantum noise of the spin squeezing state. Rather, you read the, the displacement of, the, of your quantum state due to this squeezing and anti squeezing operations. 
and it, 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 by reading out the, the noise is still the, the, the classical noise, but it, but the, the signal itself that you are sensing uh, that you want to sense has been amplified by this time reversal um, operation. So that this could be very useful for quantum sensing. Maybe um, uh, the one 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 thing that I want to study on is the, uh, this diffasing. Maybe I want to go into a little bit of detail about what you know this diffasing mechanism. So so we we do this many many pulses in the middle. So kind of dynamic decoupling pulse. I don't want to bore you with this with the with the details. Except this really allows us to remove any single particle diffasing noise and really look at the diffasing as a function of the many particle space. And you can see that maybe it's getting boring to you a little bit. You know, the, the serenity contrast is with the, uh, the function of time. And it seemed like in, in the, about a year ago when we were studying this, looks like the, this decay curve is proportional to the chi square. Uh, the, the, this uh, difference between I think is being extremely different. It looks like uh, as we tune different chi's, we can see these different decay curves. And we have a, a sort of a empirical data that this proportion of the chi square, but then we don't have a real good physical picture of why this is the chi square, except intuition wise, uh, this would looks like it's dipole moment raised to the power of four, because remember chi is proportional to dipole moment squared. So it looks like it's, it's like the DC dipole, because it's actually accepted that we have these AC dipoles with the vision. And then we want to confirm if that's correct or not correct in the future. And but there was a challenge when we tried to do this extensively because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the spin dynamics happening at a short time scale. But if you wait for a long time, then it's actually not just come fly, there's a loss going on. And we are in this regime that we are not protecting the loss at the moment. Uh, and so the, the, you don't really have too much time for the, the molecules that have an appreciable amount of molecule gets lost. And that really is the sort of a challenging for us. How do you separate the time scales between when you can study spin physics versus if the system becomes really lost at the collision of physics is defacing the system and it's like an S weighted collision is like a loss. And so, so, so we put on now some transverse lattice. So you can see kind of interesting, right? We started the 3D lattice. We jump into the 2D geometry with about to just walking free, so we can study some sort of a collective physics because we, we have only one set of harmonic oscillator modes, and these modules are occupying those oscillator modes that we can use the collective physics to, to kind of tease out all these high parameters. But now we have to go, go in the middle where you want to put a little bit of a moving potentials so that the tunneling itself starting to be turned on. The, the, the motion can be impeded a little bit. Maybe this is the, the place where you can also study super exchange interactions and so on. This called a TJVW model, where you have uh, basically then we cover the model with, 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 with the multiple degrees of freedom incorporated with tunneling, with outside interactions, with super exchange interactions, and so on, all coupled together. And that's really the ultimate system that we want to study with that kind of bit, uh, gas. And you can see quite, quite interesting uh, that. I showed you this picture before. This is the picture where, uh, I'm sorry, this data points are all on top of each other, but the ground points, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, let me start with uh, the, the pink points where you have no transverse confinement, right? It's a zero dr, meaning there's no transverse lattice, it's a zero dr report on recoil of energy in, in the transverse confinement. The, this, this is the data that we can see. Uh, the loss, uh, the, the loss of contrast is very asymmetrical in comparison to the case when I showed you earlier with a three-dimensional lattice with a 65 degree recoil on in full three directions. This is the, this situation. I already showed you the, the, the simulation of the base. Um, sorry, the, the, there's a point away now. Uh, the, the simulation of the base is those green points. And it looks like, and remember I was mentioning this, it looks like a symmetrical, that only cared about the the, the magnitude of chi, but not the sign of the chi. But this physics becomes very different when you have the molecules do not have any confinement. They have the like roaming free in this two dimensional space in, the, in this pink data points. You can see they become asymmetric. Uh, it's still it phase relatively fast when you have spin exchange interactions, but they do not phase as much when you go to the Ising dominated interaction here. 
and and then the, the, the situation uh reverses in some way uh, well not quite reverse it's also very dramatically different when you have some sort of middle case when you have five people in recoil lattice there these are the browns the field square points and you can see uh that that everybody enjoys the tightening point where they have multiple phasing but the brown points when you go to deep lattice really has a huge division weight um when, uh, when I say deep lattice, I made misspoke. When you are, you are, you are keeping us out with a five degree portal, trying to decide when you go to skin exchange or dominant regime, you have a huge defacing. But on the on the on the other side of uh Ising dominant regime, this shows a similar defacing as if you have the deep lattice. And, and you can do another cut, you know, for example, you can actually look at this, this defacing rate, kappa as a function of the tunneling rate and tunneling rate when it's right, really large, meaning you have no confinement. On this end, when you have tunneling which is zero, meaning you have a 3D very tight confinement, a uh, very, very deep lattice. And you can see that in that way, if you if your chi is zero, uh, this is represented by the blue squares, there's no decay because that's the Hasenberg point. And when you are on the Ising dominant regime, you are in this from uh, the, the, those uh, yellow points. And you can actually see that the decay was at a certain value, but actually comes down when you have itinerant qualities, when you have no, no spatial confinements, you actually have longer coherence. But on the other hand, when you're in the spin exchange interaction dominant regime, represented by black circles, uh, they start with similar sort of defacing. Uh, remember, in the deep lattice, they have a similar defacing with as a function of whether the tie was positive and negative doesn't matter. They start with similar defacing. It goes through huge values uh, of defacing and it comes back down when they become flashing. So these are the interesting physics that we actually try to figure out what's going on. So we have been interacting with both in Maria race group and home Yas group, understanding, you know, in some sense, we have some intuition uh, when the molecules are mostly dominated by Ising interactions, they don't, even during their collisional process, it's much easier to preserve the spin coherence than if you're in the spin exchange because you're doing this. So in the spin exchange case, when you start to have tightly confined molecules in the spin model, pure spin model, you start to let them go. And they actually, it's kind of introduced a disorder. And it's, that's why the, the spin exchange is very quickly defacing the whole system. But if you let them keep going, lowering the light step, potential lower and lower up to the point where you have no chance for status anymore, then you can kind of get into the collective regime again, so that the, the coherence comes back. It's kind of a really interesting while if you look at the icing interaction dominant regime, uh, it never goes through this big peak, it just, it just kind of continues to come back down here to the collective existence. So these are the process we try to really understand this, the starting to look into dipolar interactions, collisions, itinerant uh, tunneling process, and so on to, to see that. Uh, the whole picture actually theory curves starting to emerge uh, to, to be able to actually explain these kind of physics that we're observing. So what's the tunneling rate for this? The tunneling rate is down here that can be going from zero meaning it's like deep between bodies all the way to some field of the curves. It's a comparable to type of yeah so that's why the theory calculation that uh, we actually got those data back uh three four months ago but theory has been but that some uh, physical intuition I'm just explaining to you now feels mostly in line with what I've observed, but, but in, to, to have a quantitative theory, it's, it's taking a while. But what's really interesting is, again, I want to come back to the experimental point. The, this is being tuned by electric field. And if you go out to benchmark for K engineering, What's best is uh, I don't even really quite understand what's going on here. So it has complicated spin dynamics and so on with this motion. Well, let me do a put out system to real test. What if I say I'm not going to use electrical field now? I'm just going to do itinerant spin physics using floating engineering again using the rotating on the in the on the on the block sphere and realizing there's various different terms for ising and spin exchange. And what's surprising is electrical field, this was the data I was showing you earlier, uh, and, and under a particular, uh, I think it was a, a 65 recoil with no lattice in the transverse plane, zero, zero. 
And this was the data I was showing you. Ising interaction shows no spin decay, and Ising interaction, uh, sorry, spin stream interaction shows spin shows decay by the table points, uh, and the green points are done by global engineering without a vacuum field. And they show qualitatively similar trend, and indicating you know the Sproke engineering works when the model is completely pinned down in, in the as pure spin model, but even when they are starting to move around, the blocking engineering can still capture the physics as, as being uh, dictated by the tuning board actual field. And maybe I'll end my talk by just showing you one uh, one fun slide that was triggered by the discussion with uh, Nisha students when we were showing them start uh, earlier this month uh, or last month, showing this thing uh, blocking engineering. And they said, oh, it would be fun to, to look to think about doing two axis twisting. But the two axis twisting is in some ways uh, very easy to think about. Like we had a spin exchange interaction, xx plus yy. And since you can move your block sphere and, and spend a different amount of time in the block sphere, you can actually turn that into xx minus yy by, by some false sequence. And what the difference of xx plus yy is xx minus yy. This, this term, of course, aside from a, a spin constant term, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is nothing but s dot s. So you can think of this term is nothing but s z squared term. This one, of course, has now two centers, x squared minus y squared. And you can think of there's two centers counter-rotating. And that's why it's called two axis twisting. And the y axis twisting is just around one above the equatorial plane is moving along one way, the other equatorial is moving along a separate way. And that's the, the single axis twisting term for spin squeezing. Here you have two axes that can uh, control rotating, X and the Y control rotating, and we'll see very different dynamics of the spin operation. And in the mean field level, we can actually now see very interesting physics uh, from this. For example, you can actually directly look at X, Y, Z uh, evolution, X, X, S, Y, S, Z, and you can see similar sort of oscillations if you move along the equatorial plane. But the difference is showing up in the S, Z component. Yeah, in the single axis twisting, there's no modulation. But in the two axis twisting, yeah, you can see the modulations uh, and two cycles as you rotate around 360 on the equatorial plane. And this is a hallmark uh, of the two axis twisting. We can even show the two axis twisting gives rise to this exponential growth in the North Pole and the South Pole. If you start North Pole, South Pole, you can see uh, if you follow the spin Hamiltonian, uh, you can actually see the SZ term exponentially growing at the beginning. And these are the data that's, uh, that's showing up. Uh, sorry if I use laser from the guy. But, but you can see this kind of a picture depending on. Which as you middle angle P, you set yourself up. And depending on which uh, initial SD angle, whether you're pointing to the input, uh, North Pole or South Pole, you can actually plot the growth of SD component as a function of time. S D S D D T is a is the vertical axis that basically showing the slope of the growth as SD component and it has show exactly this kind of a two axis twisting dynamics will tell you about. How the spin is going to grow or shrink, um, and and it matches with the uh, theoretical uh, calculation quite well. So at the moment, you know, it's very exciting level for me to come to visit Harvard and sitting in Marcus's lab, and students were telling me about this spin squeezing with magnetic dipole interactions in in using early patterns, and in some sense, uh, I'm showing you some mean field physics of the spin. Moving around, I'm not showing you a spin noise. What's limiting us? Why am, am, am I not showing you sort of two axis twisting, spin squeezing, two more squeezing kind of kind of physics? Uh, that's because the molecular detection at the moment limits us. The molecular detection is uh, is not very high quantification, unfortunately. The, the atomic detection is much easier, and, and especially with the back, uh, quantum gas microscope, that you can really start to see. Um, Quantum projection noise of each individual beam atom, and therefore you can actually see spin noise go below the standard quantum limit. For molecules, this is like the key challenge we have to solve. How do you detect molecular state as a high efficiency? Because an opportunity like this is incredible. Like you, 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 I hope I convinced you, it's actually very easy to, to control the molecular state component. Now, how do we use that resource for 
quantum metrology, there's one key bottleneck. It helps with impact molecules with a high value. And that maybe I'll leave that uh, as a challenge for, for the whole community. Uh, I know that things are working here and maybe we made some huge improvements. So, so with that, I want to thank uh, the group, the current group that's been shown on the left hand side. Uh, it is particularly two graduate students really have been taking a leadership role. Uh, Cal Miller is a former student of John Boyle's, and Annie came from Princeton. Jun Yu just joined us from Dr. Wong School from Hong Kong. And uh, uh, both Henrik and Christoph had gone back to Europe. Uh, they, they came at, at for a short time stay. And I also want to recognize the, the, uh, the three recent alumni who have made really allowed us to do these things at like Kai Matsuda. And we also bias both came from Harvard uh, as they were undergrad here with Comfort and John and came to the graduate student. Jim Lu came from Wolfgang's group. So they're all sort of Cambridge educated people uh, and they really made a big difference in, uh, in our uh, in a lot of their work. And of course, long standing collaboration with Anna Maria Ray on the theory side, John Ball and Bible collisions. And very recently, with um, well, actually, not very recently. Nisha told me, remember, I mentioned the early days of a Wahoopa, this was more than 10 years ago. But very recently, protein engineering has been very, very fruitful, and Norm has been always been innovating, telling us about many of our papers with the back of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
maybe we're, we're going to have like a long range sales, uh, but maybe not completely dive to water. Yeah, uh, well, you can also think of uh, when you, know, you can, if the interaction becomes so strong, you know, suppose I take the two, two lower two, two molecules down here, one molecule can jump a, a, a higher orbital, the other one can jump the lower, and the energy is always still conserved. But now you, you have, now you have multiple of these upgrades against the system. It's no longer like coming. Molecules are frozen in momentum space. The molecules are can move around. They're changing velocity. That's what a collisional physics would be. Right? If it was, I just interact with you, kind of, I can go zipping by through you. You change my trajectory a little bit, but I never would really change it by momentum. Yeah, that verse when you and I come together and boom, have a real collision, I go up, you go down, and that's going to change the dynamics of the whole system. It's going to actually change the interaction exponent that you're seeing. Because here you're writing as a collective kind of kind of overall. When there are bipolar interactions, are we gonna like see for example bipolar interaction now? Or is it gonna be some like current design interactions? The, the 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 physics like uh, when it's in some sense it relates to Bert's question, right? So you say what you're asking is well even if you change it, one molecule went up, one molecule went down, but as since you always told us. Roughly speaking, you know, whether you're in this trajectory or that trajectory, the interaction of the dipole is roughly equal. That's actually true. But it, the problem is that the, those five, five, those violent interactions between each other, when one goes up, one goes down, you start to like encode big phase shifts. And you actually start to be coherent. Yeah. Remember, my dipole actually has a, has a coherence on it. It's not, it's not DC dipole where you know, I just use a DC like real polarized part. It's actually having these dipoles being in superposition of zero to one. So when they start to change the trajectories, you have to put it on with a big phase shift, they start to be called here with each other. And that, that's the complication I feel that's how this new model is replaced. And the similar thing with block. Like the way when you have the coherence with the your dipole is reliant on the fact that you have a coherence for position of zero to one. And each time we collide, we, we give each other the location. And that one of them, that's manageable, that's that I can describe this, you know, most exactly the, the spaceship that in, in this kind of physics. But if it becomes too violent, the, the system decays. Decay. And that's what I was trying to say about the consciousness and so on. It, it's actually quite complicated to, to really understand all of it. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, so what happens if you have even bigger dipole? I guess. Yeah, I um, I think if you have an even bigger dipole, you know, it's a really kind of energy scale that you'll be looking looking yourself into. Uh, this picture might be a, a good picture. So here's the the chi represents sort of a dipole interaction energy. Tunneling T is a describing how the molecules are moving around. If the dipolar physics is much stronger, uh, you know, you will care less about tunneling. And in fact, what we uh, what we think is what's happening is uh, when when you're in the intermediate strand is if I if if uh, if I want to tunnel, let's say twice to get to you, I have to go through bird. Uh, but if the dipolar interaction becomes really strong, even if bird is not there. The other dipole interaction is strong enough to put me down. So I can realize Mark Insulator without with 25% because the dipole interaction is so strong. But, you know, the interaction stress is much bigger than tunneling over three sites. So even if there are multiple middle sites which are unoccupied, nobody wants to go because of dipole interaction. Yeah. So that's certainly what will impact the dynamics. Um, how how the kinetic energy will come in and so on will all. In the end, what will come down to the, the relative energy comparison that all of us kinetic versus on site. I, I do believe that's the universal physics. Like, that would be the, way, the, way, the same. I, I think it will be very similar. Any more questions? Sharon, again. Yes. I wanted to like, um, uh, uh, you mentioned, for example, like uh, simulating the uh, conduction uh, phase with this kind of platform. Can you actually load it up to such that you can actually realize? Yeah, yeah, actually, this lies truly the most uh, challenging experiment. And we actually about to, with a floating engineering finished, uh, 
And uh, this kind of physics we are coming to a really good understanding. What do we want to go back to, to do is starting to go back to the very first picture slide. I think that's been the, the holy grail kind of a goal for us is to go back to this picture. Um, where you can uh, get into very easily depend upon the S curve potentially. And we have found that, except if you want to study the physics of uh, no, D wave pairing and, and so on uh, across these different matrix and so on. And if you want to study like superconductivity and uh, that physics, where you start to have fermions pairing up by the back of interactions and, and study the transport properties through the systems like this. We need the temperature to be lot lower. The TLT at the point one is not that. It actually has to go to TLT at the point oh five or so. So you, you, the kinetic energy has to be lower than the dipole interaction. Okay, this goes back to the conference question. If you have much stronger dipole moment, you might be able to realize this physics much sooner. And so this lies, you know, if you can get it 10 to by kind of dipole uh, and you get to TLT at the point three, maybe you start to Okay, I mean, we know that we, we cannot do that. And then, so we're trying to go back and um, learning some tricks from Harvard, uh, from Marcus, like a podium artist. So remember, I showed you multiple, multiple pancakes. Right now, what we're trying to do is crush all the multiple pancakes into a single pancake by the podium artist and do a, a, a big evaporation in a single 2D pancake. Um, and therefore, they the then can split into two and, and, and then look into the like, Deeply degenerate of the gas, hopefully, we get to that deeply degenerate of the gas and start looking like pairing images and so on. And that's going to be the next sort of, sort of technological level, the next step. For now, we are just enjoying some space of experience. The first time we can tune the electric field at will, and we can mix up the rising versus string exchange, we can do full heat engineering. It's actually quite interesting to think about that, that area. Fantastic. There are no more questions. I think pizza is arriving soon, but before that, I'd like you to really, in really loud claps, <laughs> thank <laughs> June for the time. Thank you. Thank you. So pizza is apparently coming soon. So thanks. Thanks for coming. So the instructor talks saying that the measurement is a problem, but we mean that the the measurement.